Hi, everyone, and welcome to our second edition of Summer Book Break, where Molly and I are going to talk about suspense, mysteries, and thrillers that we've been reading lately, lately, otherwise known as Murder, Mayhem, and Molly episode. Mm-hmm. Yep, those two words always go with my name. That's right. Yeah, Murder and Mayhem. That's what you think of when well, you think of your friendly local librarian. <laughs> I have been on a binge lately. I can't even tell you. For a while, I was really off thrillers, but... I've read so many lately, I hope I don't get them all confused as I I talk about them. Yeah, the plot points sometimes uh, mix together. I read a bunch in preparation for this because uh, mysteries aren't my usual genre, so I read quite a few just to try to find some that I liked. So I know, I'm kind of hoping that a lot of people, like, I always read mysteries in the summer, I don't know why, but to me it's like, Not mindless, but it's good entertainment. Right, right. And I like the puzzle of trying to figure out who did it. So, I don't know. But it's interesting because the books that I have today, two of the ones I picked are a little bit more literary mysteries, Mm -hmm. which is unusual. But I found it very hard to put both of them down. So, I am going to get started with my first one, which I actually read probably a while ago. But it's Ashley Elston, First Lie Wins. And this one has over 27,000 reviews on Goodreads. Over, It's like an average of 4.08. I believe it came out early in the year. Yeah, I want to say February, March. I think, wasn't it a Reese's pick, too? Yes, and yeah. I think I had to actually buy more copies of this because it just kind of grew in popularity. Mm-hmm. But anyway, the setup of this one, we've got Evie Porter, and she seems on the surface to be a nice southern girl. She's got everything, the perfect doting boyfriend, house with a white picket fence, a garden, a nice group of friends. Only catches Evie Porter doesn't really exist. She's not who she says she is. So this one I actually thought was pretty entertaining, and I don't know if I would classify it as a thriller. It was more like an elaborate cat and mouse game. Um, Because Evie, what you find out is she has got an assignment given to her by the mysterious Mr. Smith. And I really got Charlie's Angels vibes, only Mr. Smith is evil instead of being like the... Oh, gosh, what was his name? I'm drawing a blank. Was it Charlie? Charlie's Angels. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Uh, Yes, I think you're right. But anyway, after being introduced to Ryan's friends group, people are starting to get suspicious about Evie's background and so forth. And then they go to a party and a woman comes up and introduces herself as Evie's real name. And Evie has guarded her, her real identity. So she knows right away that it's kind of like a catch-22, mm-hmm. like Mr. Smith is gunning for her. Yeah, her he's last, testing her. Right. Her last job did not go too well. So you have this elaborate back and forth of how she's trying to figure out what Mr. Smith is doing. But meanwhile, naturally, she's actually really starting to fall in love for Ryan, her current... Who has a nice house with a white picket fence and That's, nice gardens. Right. And but a is, good neighborhood, too, I remember. <laughs> yes, but is Ryan who he says he is? So that's the question. So you have a lot of secrets, identities, you know, back and forth. Is it implausible? Absolutely. Uh, was it fast-paced and entertaining? Yeah, I thought it was. So I enjoyed all the rides and twists and turns of Evie's adventures. And if nothing else, I just thought it was something a little bit different than the typical girl is missing, you know, let's find out who did it, is it a serial killer type thing, which is basically, you know, all my other books. (laughs) Right. I read this one too, and I I felt the same way you did about it. There was some good twists in there, um, and I didn't have it quite figured out. I also really liked how the ending turned out. Me too. Which a lot of times is kind of a letdown with these these thrillers, unless there's some huge twist right at the end. Um, But I thought this was a fun book too. Yeah. Oh, good. So what was your first one? Uh, My first one is uh, very different in tone uh, called All the Sinners Bleed by S.A. Cosby, which uh, came out last year in 2023. And um, it's like a very gritty Southern noir 
uh, crime mystery and it centers around Titus Crown who is the first elected black sheriff in a rural Virginia county. Um, he left his hometown for a little while, went to work for the FBI, but now he's back uh, to take care of his elderly father and he's been sheriff in this county for a, exactly a year. Dealt with the usual, you know, petty crimes, domestic violence. They have a big drug alcohol problem in the mm -hmm. county. There's also some simmering racial tensions um, that are happening. There's a far right group that wants to have a parade to celebrate their Confederate history. So they're worried about potential protests and violence. So he's dealing with all that and on the anniversary of his first year of being sheriff, right in the first chapter, they get a call saying that there's an active shooter at the local high school. So Titus and his deputies, of course, rush to the scene where they find that one of the most beloved teachers in the school has been shot down and killed um, by the killer right in his classroom in front of the students. So as the police are getting ready to go into the high school, the shooter actually comes out onto the front steps. Uh, Titus recognizes him. He's the grown son of a childhood friend. And the shooter starts kind of raving in, you know, like a manic way, shouting things about angels of death and alluding that the teacher had done terrible things. And one of the last things he says is, check the teacher's phone. And, you know, the shooter, I think, takes a few steps towards the deputies, he's still holding his gun, and before Titus can prevent it from happening, his deputies fatally shoot. Um, this young man. Yes. And that starts a whole involved investigation where Titus does get his hands on the teacher's phone and find some really horrific things on there, photo evidence, videos, which leads to the hunt for another serial killer who's still alive and on the loose that Titus has to find. Um, this killer is targeting black children and teenagers, doing terrible things, carving religious messages into their flesh before he kills them. I mean, this book was really pretty grim, and it's not something I normally would have picked up, like, I don't even watch true crime things on Netflix. I can barely get through a Law and Order episode. But this ended up being one of my favorite books of last year just because the writing is so strong. And this author was able to take some really heavy topics, racism, you know, the violence, pedophilia, religious zealotry, and it wasn't overwhelming or heavy-handed. Mm -hmm. um, I was really interested in this character of Titus. As the story goes on, you find out more and more about his background, the things that went down at the FBI, like the trauma involved there. He's trying to keep this fairly new relationship afloat which is difficult because the girlfriend is definitely taking a backseat to this hunt for a serial killer. Right, yeah. Um, and it's not helped by the fact that his ex-girlfriend shows up in town because she's doing a true crime podcast on all oh, these man. murders. So I really liked this book. I think you read it as well, didn't you? I did, and I also really liked it. I like S.A. Cosby a lot, and... Kind of the same thing you said. He is not something that I would typically pick up. The Southern noir, you know, very dark, very yes. gritty, lots of violence. But um, I read Razorblade Tears. I thought it was great. And his first one, I think it was Blacktop Top Wasteland. Something. Yeah. And I've also done them on audio. And mm -hmm. the narrator for those is is awesome yeah. because he had elements of of humor in there as well and the way he does these different characters was i don't know i i really i i enjoy him i yeah, thought I, I thought that one was really good as well yeah the um, author has a really interesting backstory as well he also grew up in virginia rural area you know didn't Poor he work kid. as an undertaker or something? His wife owns a... Yeah. Yes. A mortuary. <laughs> yes. Or, he's, oh yeah. I think he's about 50 years old, but um, grew up 
you know, with a single mom, poor, in a trailer, uh, no running water till he was about 16. And he says he always loved to write and that the first thing he can remember writing was a 75-page werewolf story <laughs> in the sixth grade that was so gruesome that they called, the, they sent him to the school psychiatrist <laughs> and his mother was just livid and so mad that he did this and he just thought it was really cool. Like, he liked his story. Right. And, you know, he went to community college but had to drop out because of money and he ended up um, working at Lowe's and becoming an assistant manager. He was there for 11 years. And then in his 40s, I think he's only been published for the last four or five years. He has right. four books. Yeah. In his 40s, he, you know, got a break. And and now he, you know, I think it, it was a really good book. I yeah, I think I'm going to read his other ones. Yeah, he's become like an auto read for me. So yeah. I discovered him. I got one of his books on, I think, Book of the Month Club. Yeah, And then I went back and read his other ones, and then I read the new one. Yeah, but. I think uh, this book, uh, All the Sinners Bleed, ended up on Barack Obama's like best of 2023 right. yep. list. I think you're right. All right, my next one is called God of the Woods by Liz Moore, and it just came out on July 2nd. This one interested me because the setting is the Adirondacks, which oh, is wow. someplace that is near and dear to my heart. So, um, and the author Liz Moore wrote Long Bright River, which I also really liked. And that one was kind of a gritty mm -hmm. crime story, a little bit police procedural, substance abuse. And some of those same themes are in um, The God of the Woods. But what we have is a young woman, her name is Barbara Von Lahr, and she is discovered missing from her summer camp bunk one morning in August of 1975. The interesting thing is, this just isn't any camper. Barbara von Lahr's family owns the piece of land in the Adirondacks where this camp is set. And her would have been her older brother in 1961 as an eight-year-old was on a hike in the woods and disappeared. I was going to say, I, I felt something bad coming there. <laughs> yes. Body never recovered, you know, assumed dead. So that event pretty much splintered Barbara's family. Her mother became an alcoholic. Her life totally changed. Her husband was very distant, not really engaged with the family, either buried in work or his social status. Um, so Barbara has been looking forward to being at the camp and getting away. And this story is told from that 1961 to 75 it's sort of flashbacks and also from multiple points of view. So we have Barbara's camp roommate, whose name is Louise. She is from a local family. And that's the other thing you get in this book is the class distinctions yeah. between the townies that may work at these camps or whatever and the people, the rich people that come into the Adirondacks that own yeah. these fancy properties. So Tracy, who is her bunk bunkmate at camp, she's kind of gawky. She's struggling with her parents' divorce. She's longing for a friend. She's, she's kind of a funny, quirky character. Then you have Judy. Judy is investigating um, the, the disappearance. She is a female policewoman who's just been promoted in the 1970s. Yeah, that's pretty rare. In the <laughs> Absolutely. So you get some of that and how yeah. she's dealing with the backlash of being a woman, trying to investigate what happened at this family, not being respected. Um, and then Barbara's mother, Alice. So you start to learn more about her point of view, what's mm -hmm. happened to her within the family. Alice is an alcoholic, but her husband, Peter, is is... Not great. Um, her mother was one of those mothers that was relentless with her criticism and constantly pushing Alice because she had looks and everything to marry, you know, get into that social right. status, so to speak. So, of course, the whole family has secrets. Yeah. And the weekend that Barbara disappears, they are supposed to be having a celebratory party. So there's been a lot of people influxed at the estate right next to the camp and you have wealthy artists and ballet dancers and all these famous people so and then you have this disappearance. I was going to say a lot of people who could have been the right. cause of the disappearance. Right. Yeah. So it's kind of like a detective nightmare, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was really interesting and once I started reading, I couldn't put it down. But like I said, I've, I've 
vacation to the Adirondacks. So I could really picture the setting and the right. way it felt, the way it smelled, you know, everything. Yeah. So um, um, I'm definitely going to be reading this one. I didn't recognize the author's name and I typed it into, you know, my Goodreads, the book that you were going to discuss. And um, turns out Liz Moore has written two five-star books that I have read in the past, and I don't I don't give out five stars all that easily. Um, I think it was Unseen World and Heft, which I don't think were mysteries at all. Yeah, um, I could be remembering wrong, but so I really like this author, so I'm gonna definitely pick that up. Yeah, there's been a lot of buzz about this book too. Yeah, so it's got a nice cover too. If I yes, recall. yes, it's kind of interesting where the the forest and paint, paint running down, and you'll find out. <laughs> The significance. Mm. Like, I don't want to tell you too yeah, much about yeah. the plot because it really is best just to go into it and get sucked in, you That's know. Cool. Yeah, the cover is awesome. Yeah. yeah. Looking forward to that one. All right. Um, what's your next one, Molly? The next one I read was completely different than All the Sinners Bleed in tone. And um, it's called Everyone in My Family Has Killed Someone by Benjamin Stephen. And this was a witty, funny book. Uh, the author is Australian, and he's also a stand-up comedian. Oh, boy. Which is pretty apparent as soon as you start reading the book. Um, our narrator is, his name is Ernest Cum Cunningham, Ernie, and he starts speaking to the reader right away. He breaks the fourth wall. Mm -hmm. And Ernie makes his living by self-publishing how-to manuals to write mysteries. So <laughs> he starts off telling the reader that he is not going to be an unreliable narrator in this story and to prove that he immediately tells us on which pages are deaths or murders going to happen and of course one is pretty soon at the beginning of the book I think page 14 or something and what is happening is Ernie is going to a family reunion at an isolated ski resort in Australia, which I had a hard time wrapping my head right, around. Yeah, I'm kind um, of picturing the outback. So. Yeah, no, no, it was there was snow, and he's on his way to this family reunion, and he's dreading it. And the whole reason for the family reunion is his older brother Michael is about to get out of jail, and he's going to meet them there um, after a three-year prison sentence for homicide. Oh, nice. So. Ernie. Just three? Just three. There were some, there's, there's reasons for it. Okay. They did make sense in the story. Um, but he gets to the resort where you, the reader, meet all the extended family. There's the uptight aunt who arranged the whole, uh, the whole reunion with spreadsheets and timelines. There's the wealthy uncle that wears the Rolex, the addict of, I think, uh, stepsister I can't even remember there there were a lot of members of this family and every one of them has killed someone in some way or another and you find out how as the book goes on but of course the first morning they wake up and there's a dead body on the ski slope <laughs> and no one knows who this person is and although they were in the middle of the snow they somehow died by um, inhaling smoke and being burned to death so uh, wow since his family already has a convicted killer in it, plus there's some other issues with the law. The Cunninghams are suspects. So Ernie, of course, having that, you know, murder mystery writing background. Decides is, to document this whole affair for us? Yes, and take us through, you know, how how the mystery is resolved. There's a big snowstorm, which traps all of them there. The body count piles up. You know, the whole thing, it got a little convoluted for me as far as what the motives were. And I'm like, why did that person kill them? Like, I couldn't keep it all straight, but I didn't really care. It was fun. Yeah. Uh, the narrator was funny and witty. And Now, um, did you listen to this one or read this one? Um, I listened to about an hour of it. Okay. Uh, I thought the narrator was fine, mm -hmm. but... I, I'm not a huge audiobook person, okay. so I, I read most of it. Um, this came out a couple years ago, and there's a sequel that just came out that I want to read. Uh, Everyone on this train is a suspect. Okay. And I think it's the same, the same family, same guy. Yeah, I think he's coming out with a Christmas one, too. Oh, yeah, I think so. You know, nothing like holidays and murder. You know, why yeah, not? It was a fun book. Yeah. I mean, I liked it. Yeah. All right, my, my next one is one I really just finished reading, and it's called All the Colors of the Dark by Chris Whitaker. 
I believe it was just named like a Jenna's pick for July. It's something. I can't something, remember. Yeah. I can't um, some celebrity book club. Pretty sure it's Jenna. But um, this one was a five-star read for me, and I'm pretty sure it's going to land on my best books of the year. I just, um, and I have to say, this is, this is kind of an epic book. It's over. It's little over 600 pages. Oh, wow. So this is not like, and normally during the summer, the last thing I want is a big old chunk a chunk book. But I opened this book, and you, it, the action starts right away, and I just got sucked into this story and these characters. So it's 1975. <laughs> that seems to be the year. Of- That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With a lot of these, right, because Barbara von Lahr went 1975. away. 1975. But so I like that time period, the Vietnam War is kind of ending. You know, you have all that kind of cultural thing. And once again, there's a family, a daughter of a wealthy family in town, and she is targeted by an abductor. But unlike Barbara, um, there's a young kid that lives in this town. He's pretty much a social outcast. He was born without an eye. Hmm. So he wears an eye patch a lot. He's very into pirates because his mom has tried to make him accept this. He's yeah. very poor. Make it a fun. Yeah. Make <laughs> You're it, missing an eye. You're missing Arr. an eye. <laughs> but, um, you know, he gets beaten up a lot and yeah. so forth. So he sees this van pull up and they're attempting to stuff, you know, this young girl, Misty, into the van. And he decides, I got to do something. So he runs down. He rushes the person. He knocks it down. He tells Misty to run. She does. But he mm. is taken instead. Yeah. Um, stabbed, so I don't want to go into too much. But anyway, the weird thing is, is later he's got this friend, this young teenage friend, who's a girl. Um, her name is Saint. She is also kind of like on the fringes of popularity. You know, imagine middle school and 13 years old. It's kind of a painful time for anybody. Yeah. Um, except for our beauties like Misty, who have the world by the tail because they're rich and beautiful. But um, Saint is determined not to let the policeman in her town forget about her friend and what he's done. She knows that he's a great person, one of the only friends she has. And and saved Misty. Yeah, saved Misty, and she decides that she's going to start her kind of own investigation to figure out what's going on because things are not adding up for her she's very smart she's a beekeeper like i said she's kind of a fun quirky character but also extremely loyal so she does get on this trail and she does find him but when we reunite them we find out that he wasn't alone in there where where he was kept captive there was another person another girl and He's haunted by the fact that he got out and this girl didn't, and he becomes obsessed with that. So you have these characters and how this, these two events have affected them and the trajectory of their lives, how it completely changes because of this. Um, Saint was originally got into Dartmouth or something later, becomes a police person, so... This is something they all kind of think about. And I don't want to give too many plot points away, but like I said, these characters were built in the, in the way that you could believe it. Mm-hmm. None of them were perfect. They were all flawed, but in a way that you found interesting, and I don't know, it just, it, it's one of the better books I've read. So It's a five for you? It is a five for me. God, and like, I feel like I should put a graphic on the screen. <laughs> like explosions, ding, ding. Yes. you know. <laughs> winner, 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 chicken dinner, okay. fireworks. I'll have to read it and, and see if it's a five for me, too. Yeah, I'd be interested. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but like I said. 600 pages is a, is a commitment, though. I thought I was, uh, this next one I'm talking about had over 400 pages, and I was impressed by that. <laughs> well, normally that's that's kind of how I am too. I'm looking for that sweet spot of 300 and some pages, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, we we have things to read. That's we got right. A I list. got too many books to read, but I read this one fairly quickly too. And literally, like, I didn't want to do anything all weekend except sit with this book. 
Well, I so. can do that with a mediocre book, and it will prevent me from doing anything all weekend. So, <laughs> all right. So that that was my my ending. So, what is your next um, one? My last one is called "Symphony of Secrets" by Brendan Slocum. This was published in 2023, and I would not say this is your standard mystery thriller. It is kind of a musical thriller blended with historical fiction. Mm -hmm. Um, The premise centers on this fictional American composer and musician whose name is Frederick Delaney. Uh, He was active in the 1920s, and the book describes him as being the most influential and prolific composer in American history. He's a big deal. And in the present day, there is an internationally known foundation, the Delaney Foundation, which has done decades of charitable work, um, including giving musical instruments and scholarships to uh, needy children. And so one of those kids that they helped, you know, decades ago has grown up to be one of um, a very successful music historian. He's a professor. He's an African-American named um, Bern Hendricks, and he works at the University of Virginia. So one day he gets this phone call from the Delaney Foundation saying that they have unearthed a long-lost manuscript manuscript of... um, one of Delaney's most, you know, the most famous work. He did this five-part opera centered around the Olympics in the 1920s, <laughs> and they found the fifth part. Oh, wow. And so he is has studied Delaney his entire career. He idolizes this musician, so he jumps on the first plane to New York City. Um, the foundation puts him up in posh accommodations he has to meet with all their lawyers and sign ndas and agree not to you know tell anybody about his research so he has to authenticate this manuscript and then also prepare it to be performed for Mm -hmm. a modern audience and as soon as he gets his hands on it he realizes that there's something different about this manuscript there's initials jr on there that they've never seen before um, doodles shapes things like that and so he enlists the help of a a longtime friend of his ebony who's this like brilliant code cracker from the bronx and they start diving into this mystery and i feel like i'm giving something away by saying this but they tell you on the book jacket that maybe Frederick Delaney is not the one who composed these right. works, yeah. which I wish they hadn't have told me right on the, the book jacket, but they did. Um, it's still an intriguing story because half of the book takes place in the 1920s. And that's where the reader meets the young Freddie Delaney, who is a struggling musician in New York City, and this woman named Josephine Reed, who he just chances upon at a jazz club one night. She's sitting in the corner. She's a young black woman. She's homeless. She's disheveled. And it tells the story of um, the relationship and how they were friends and how that over the years became something um, a little more sinister where he was passing off her work. Uh, Present day, you know, it turns into kind of a thriller where, of course, this powerful foundation does not want their musicians legacy tarnished right so there's the search for the truth and you know that type and the of thing. cover up that would ensue yes so this um th- i liked this it started a little slow um but i thought the the concept was very interesting they i can't remember if they say it specifically in the book but it's pretty obvious to the reader that josephine is has autism she sees and experiences music um and shapes and colors and that was interesting to me Mm -hmm. um but this is his second book and the first one i believe you read i did it was the the violin conspiracy yeah and that one had it was interesting to me because he is a, a a black author and also a serious musician. So you get a lot of that backstory. Mm -hmm. Um, And the first one deals more with a missing violin, which of course is a Stradivarius, and how this young black boy got it. It was was deeded down through his family, Mm -hmm. and then you got into more of the slavery, and also the competitions and things that he goes through and trying to break into a world where 
not a lot of young men of color are present. Mm -hmm. And it was just very, very interesting to read. Um, yeah. yeah, I liked him. I haven't read that one, but I, I t probably definitely will at some point. Yeah, I would definitely read something else by him. So since we're only doing one episode per month in the summer, Molly and I have some quick bonus picks for you that are also mysteries. Um, I read one called One Perfect Couple by Ruth Ware, and this is totally different than the other ones that I've picked because I consider two of mine to be more literary mm -hmm. kind of mysteries in nature. This one is a mixture of like Survivor and The Bachelor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not talking uh, depth here, love people. Island. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're talking entertaining and a very quick read to sit by the pool and kind of enjoy. So you have a postdoc, Lydia, she's in a rut. Things are going well for her boyfriend, but he just got invited to be on this reality show. And despite her misgivings, she says yes. And naturally, they go on this island. Their phones are all taken away. And um, which, I, yeah, I read this, too. And that was like a five page description of the, the pain they all felt about having their devices taken away. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can't capture their selfies or their beautiful yes. smiles anymore. Looks but like anyway, this one just came out, too. Yep. Pardon me. Looks like it just came out. Yes. Yes. It's a pretty new book. But um, so anyway, you're cut off from the mainland. You know, bodies are piling up, accumulating. Is this game show all too real? Stakes are life and death. So, yeah, that was, that was if you're into more that fun, fast-paced thriller, uh, Ruth Ware is kind of known for that at this point. Mm -hmm. Not my favorite one by her, but, you know, I definitely read the whole thing. Yeah, I did too. Um, there, I think, I actually haven't read anything else by her, but I get the feeling she's known for like a big twist. Mm -hmm. I feel like that was a little bit missing on this, but um, the survival story aspect it kept my attention. Like right. they're dealing with the elements, like there's like a hurricane, a yeah. big storm. Yeah, so it was fun. Yep. Desalination plant is knocked out. <laughs> yes, yes. How are they going to eat when the food's all spoiled? Uh -huh, yeah, definitely. Um, one of the bonus ones that I read, it's fairly new. It's a cozy mystery for you cozy mystery fans called Murder Most Owl by Sarah Fox. Mm -hmm. And it is the first of a new cozy mystery series. Uh -oh. Magical Menagerie Mystery Number One. And it's about, uh, I'd say she's in her 30s. She's a screenwriter from L.A. And... She has to go back and help her aunt on the farm and animal, animal sanctuary. And, of course, Auntie lives in a lovely coastal town in Oregon. And um, complete with the quirky townspeople. There's a mysterious and often silent farmhand that uh -oh. has just arrived on the farm. And he also bakes. So... Spoiler, I think they're going to get together. Um, but it's a fun mystery. There's a couple cool dogs, Flossie and Fancy, an owl, Euclid. And he, um, you know, maybe these animals have some special mystery-solving powers. But it was a fun read. That I sounds fun. <laughs> Gotta love an owl. That, well, yeah. All right, my last one is Darling Girls by Sally Hepworth. And this one is... Set in England, Sally Hepworth is either England or Australia. I forgot, but I definitely no one idea. of those. But anyway, you know, supposed to be a foster home where everything looks idyllic, you know, horses on the property, mm -hmm. but it's not idyllic. Mm -hmm. We all know that. There are deep, dark secrets. And then when a, some bones are found on the property, well, that just <laughs> seals the deal. So you have three human bones. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you have three foster sisters that are now come under suspicion with these bones, but is the lady that took them all in who she says she is? No. No. So, okay. yeah. I've read a couple by Sally Hepworth, and they're, again, they're that fast-paced, you mm -hmm. know, kind of fun thriller. Yeah. Um, one that just came out a few months ago that I read was Last Murder at the End of the World by Stuart Turton and this I saw got quite a bit of buzz and I think the reason it did was it's such a blend of like 
dystopian science fiction mm-hmm. combined with a murder mystery. Um, it's 90, 90 years ago, the whole world, all of humanity was kind of wiped out by this deadly fog, except for some people on this Greek island. There's 122 villagers and these three scientist elders who are kind of keeping the deadly fog at bay. And then one day, one of those three scientists is found dead. So... Um, there's the murder mystery, and they have to figure it out. Otherwise, the deadly fog will come and wipe all of humanity out. And this is narrated by an AI narrator. Wow. Like All the villagers have this artificial intelligence voice in their head. It's kind of like their conscience. And, of course, this AI narrator is not real reliable as a narrator. So okay. this... This was interesting. Um, I found the first half, which was more the dystopia, and there was a kind of twist more interesting than the murder mystery half, um, which came at the end. But did he write that seven and a half deaths of of Evelyn Evelyn, somebody or something? Yeah, Yeah. I am. I tried to read that one, and it wasn't for me. So I don't I never know whether it. I'll pick that one up. <laughs> this one, a lot of people loved. I gave it a three. Um, the premise is interesting. So if you like sci-fi, dystopia, right. yeah. um, you'll like it. If you're looking for you know, your traditional murder mystery, I would may maybe not be your thing. Yeah, maybe not your thing. Well, we've got some definitely good and unique choices for you. Um, We will have one more episode for summer in August, and then we will be back to our twice-a-month episodes in September. As always, we thank you for listening and hope you're having a great summer. And let us know what you're reading. Thanks. Thanks. Book Break is a production of the Reese Public Library, made possible through the support of the friends of the Reese Public Library. Theme music composed and performed by Reese Public Library.